righty, let's see, uh, show my screen. Okay, so I got some fun stuff for us here. Let's see, I'm going to share. All right, so let's start with this case. I've been waiting to show this case just because I haven't gotten around to it. Um, you guys see a CT? Yes. All right, so this is a patient with uh, a male patient with tuberous sclerosis. And we were asked to exclude uh, lung involvement. If I can get the right windows, there we go. And, you know, we might be looking for lamb or something. And there's really nothing in the lungs to get excited about. But what we did have a good example of is the bones. And so one of the findings that's been described in tuberous sclerosis is the sclerotic foci. And what's interesting in this case, and I haven't seen a lot of cases of TSC, is it seems to be confined to the posterior elements of the spine, a few in the ribs posteriorly, but you don't see a lot elsewhere, maybe a few in the sternum, but just very striking diffuse bone involvement. And I can't remember what causes it. I don't know if any of you guys remember why they get these, but I thought the sagittal is very impressive look to it. And then one thing we've talked about on this webinar, which I think is an important finding, and it's, I think, a little bit of a softer call in this case, is I did find, I think I found something in the heart, and we've talked about fat in the myocardium, and I thought there was a little area here at the apex. It's subtle, and then I thought there may be another one right in here in the interventricular septum, and I thought maybe there was a couple more areas, but I think those were the two. I was most convinced about kind of a, again a soft call but it makes you wonder but uh, nothing in the upper abdomen except the porcelain gallbladder but a really good example of the bone findings of tuberous sclerosis and I, here's the i just have the head ct uh, but it shows some of the other findings that you can see um, i didn't get the mr but those calcifications of the little tubers as they call them little um, benign tumors that form in the brain and then the I can't remember if they were both yeah there's the sclerotic foci and the calvarium as well all throughout. So tuberous sclerosis without without lung involvement. Any uh, tiny nodules in the lungs, Jeff? Tiny nodules in the lungs? We didn't see any. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of an expiratory scan um, or with some motion, but we did not see anything in the lungs. A little atelectasis and stuff, but nope. No little cardiac fatty things? Yeah, I did point out some possible ones. I think there's one here. Oh, the yeah, yeah, there's one. Yeah, and there's maybe one in the septum. That's, yeah, those are the two things I was showing. Okay, this is a just a great uh, resident case or medical student case, just a really pretty example of uh, a mass, and you can sort of localize it even on the frontal view, well-defined of an incomplete border out laterally, and then, of course, this opacity lateral to it with a missing rib. So you'd think of a metastasis, um, some renal cell, thyroid, um, or it's a lung cancer with bone involvement or myeloma, and a CT. This was not much of a diagnostic dilemma, but it's just a really big um, mass here invading the canal. And this ended up actually all being a single plasma cytoma here, but just just massive with a large uh, extra uh, extra osseous component extending into almost like a malignant nerve sheath tumor here into the spinal canal. But I thought it was a really really nice example on a radiograph. And if you go to the lateral, you can oops. You can see, uh, harder to see the bone involvement of the canal, but um, you can see that it, it forms pretty obtuse angle, at least here with the chest wall. All righty. Um, along our recent theme, this was a young man who was in a car crash or a motorcycle crash, but it was two weeks ago and came in with a radiograph uh, that looked like, here's the original radiograph, looked like this. It had some vague opacity in the base, maybe unclear. Um, how much was down there, but you see it's some spine fractures. Um, and they did a trauma workup at that time and uh, has this funny looking appearance to his lungs. This peripheral ground glass opacity is very nodular, very discreet, all, nice little OP looking pattern with a sort of an atoll look to it anteriorly on the right and um, some subpleural sparing more at the bases. And um, you know, considering his time from his trauma, this would not fit with the traumatic injury nor with the distribution. And then on further uh, questioning I dug through, he vapes um, cannabis oil, not CBD oil, but actual THC cannabis oil and has been vaping it for some time and reported multiple episodes of shortness of breath after vaping. And he'd stop for a little bit and then get better and vape again and have the shortness of breath. And apparently was vaping after his crash because he was having pain 
And so um, I th I'm, I'm, my presumption is this is another case of, of vaping-induced lung and sort of OP, organizing pneumonia, predominant pattern. And in this case, he was actually vaping um, um, a THC oil-based vape juice that he, you know, not another commercially available one. So similar to some of the ones Howard shown with the particularly the potentially some of the light point component. But I, I think this is the most common pattern we've seen is this OP pattern. And uh, now that he's been here for a while, he, he you know, developed a little bit more confluent lung disease, but it seems to be now getting better again. He's it's getting a big, big infectious workup, but nothing's come back. So Jeff, this was, he was mixing his own stuff. That's my understanding, or you know, marijuana is not legal here, so it's not it's not over the it's 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 street marijuana, but it's the oil with not the CBD oil, but the actual THC oil, presumably. So he had to mix it with something. It's unclear because it's those histories are so vague. It's usually all you see is patients smokes e-cigarettes, but it specifically said he smoked marijuana in the e-cigarettes. Okay, uh, this is kind of a neat case. Uh, something I don't see very often. Well, I see the diagnosis a lot. So this is a patient with sarcoid, um, and this is their scan at presentation, and it has this so-called ground glass component to it. But if you look at it very carefully, it's actually tiny little ground glass nodules, sort of all clustering together, that give this appearance. And you can imagine back in the days of five millimeter, seven millimeter thick CTs, this was called ground glass opacity. Interesting, he has a little bit of dilated airways going through some of these areas, and there is a little bit more confluent uh, ground glass in some of it, but a good peribronchovascular distribution for sarcoid, fairly symmetric, no large lymph nodes. So that was a presentation. This is about a decade later, and he was treated at the time and sort of stabilized his lung function. But it's, it's interesting how it sort of persisted, but to my eye, and I don't know how much of it's a technical thing because that last exam was used with a sharper recon. This is what we typically use. He's got a little bit more traction bronchiectasis, but it looked like to me he still has some degree of nodularity, but maybe a little bit more confluence of the ground glass opacity, but sort of a less common manifestation of sarcoid uh, rather than the this more discrete nodules that we see. But you can clearly see some traction bronchiectasis in the areas of ground glass opacity. And it's it's very peribronchovascular in distribution, even some of the bases. If you just had one time point, you might be inclined to call this uh, OP if you didn't appreciate the, um, the small nodules component to it, but um, a less common pattern of sarcoid. And he had a bronch years ago that showed the non-caseating granulomas and no other cause. So I wonder if he's got some scarring now mixed in with that. It looks a little bit closer <laughs> in these mid and upper lungs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I suspect so. And I mean, there's definitely traction bronchiectasis out there. You can see some of the scar-like stuff. And maybe it's become more confluent with the scarring. All right. Uh, last case is kind of a cool one. I think uh, Seth and Travis will particularly like this one. So this is a two-day-old female who was born with, uh, two days old at the time of presentation, uh, born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And let me see. Um, and so uh, the other finding on it, I'm going to pull up the MR angio, is, uh, where is it? Here we go. Um, Osiris decides to, there we go. So this is the... Um, during phase, so the arterial phase, and I'm going to go ahead, once it loads, I'm going to reformat it into the axial plane. So we can see the small left ventricle, the large right heart chambers. But what's interesting is this little, uh, so if we follow this, so we've got, this is pulmonary artery here. You can see the branch pulmonary arteries. And then there's this large communication here with the descending aorta. So this is a large patent ductus. And then there's a hypoplastic aortic arch. There are the branch vessels. There's an aberrant subclavian. And then what was I picked up as well is this little funny communication uh, right here between the the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery, right where the sinuses of Valsalva is. And so it looks like there's a, a little a coronary fistula. So right here, there it is. You see this little communication between the left coronary artery and what and the and the um, Left atrium, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then so uh, it was confirmed on cath, and so I just have this one run, but it should show. You can see the early filling on this run here. Let's see if I can slow it down. Uh, here we go. So let's start it over here. Here we go. So we get the early 
Can you go back to the? No, it's it's really nice in the corner. You see it right yeah. shooting there. Yeah. Back into the. Let me go right back right there. The Can you go back to Amar? Yeah, because that's pretty darn it is darn subtle. And was that the? Uh, sorry, it's the series. It's an MR angio, and this was the arterial phase. And was it the RCA or can you can you zoom that up? Any any? It's the CERN. It's, yeah, I'll, I'll blow it up for you. Sorry. So here's here's the left main coming off the LAD, and it's this little yep. circle right there. Oh, right there. Interesting. Yeah, I think they were they were suspecting it clinically, right? Yeah, on echo. On echo, which is amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good call. Can you show the can you show the uh, cath again? Yeah. Sorry, I was having trouble loading this case this morning, so I didn't get to really look at it as close as I wanted to. So here, let's go back and file it out early. So here we are. So an aortic root. There you go. So. Right, right there. You see that blush going right there. That's there. really nice. Yeah, mm. that was the only plane I could download that I got it to work. Sometimes these cath runs are for snicking on packs, but it's nice to have it and see it. Okay, uh, I think that was it. Yep, that's it for me. I've got a couple. Okay. Can people see a split screen? Yep. Yeah. So um, this is a case I showed in 2017. This is a case of Erdheim Chester. This was the first case in that uh, Sadaka and I made the diagnosis in after a very alert resident had uh, shown us another case from overnight and told us about Erdheim Chester way back then. And it took us, we, we only made the diagnosis in this case after having been informed by that alert resident about the findings of Erdheim Chester. And then this case that had been lurking around here for about three years, suddenly we knew the diagnosis was Erdheim Chester. We had, we had pondered it for several years before thinking about things like lymphoma and mesothelioma and amyloidosis and everything around the map. But this is an early radiograph on this person from 2007 showing you the pleural thickening here, the fuzzy mediastinal borders and the coarse interstitial abnormality in the lungs. And here's what it looks like on CT in that era. This really shaggy pleural thickening, shaggy mediastinal stuff. And uh, then we get down into the abdomen <clears throat> and very nice halos around the kidneys. And then farther down, there's a lot of bowel wall thickening that showed up on some of the abdominal imaging. So let me show you lung windows David, at this point. Also some aortic stuff at the in the upper abdomen as well. That's, that's right. Yeah. And that was the that was the main finding in the other case that the resident had uh, alerted us to was the right periaortic halo as well. And there's and farther down there was a lot of bowel wall thickening that was part of this condition too. So there were biopsies that disclosed um, some fibroblasts and some histiocytes and the diagnosis was not made uh, because people weren't thinking of Erdheim Chester and then subsequently that material was retrieved and the findings were considered to be consistent with Erdheim Chester although the mutation has not been worked up in this case so let me show you the uh, the lungs in this in this early imaging and um, I'm pretty sure I'm showing you the yeah this is 2009 at this point um, you can see that there's a lot of still still residual pleural thickening. There's the mediastinal tissue thickening, and there's a fair amount of peripheral emphysema here. So a, a subpleural emphysema here looks like paraseptal emphysema as part of this condition. Mm -hmm. So the woman was lost to follow up here, and she was last seen here in 2011, at which point a lot of this uh, thickening, a lot of this infiltration of tissues had receded, and the only the only treatment she'd had was some intermittent courses of prednisone. So she was remarkably um, better looking. Um, and then this is current imaging now. This is to the, suddenly she's back in our system after an eight year hiatus. And so here she is in 2019. Uh, and now she, the, the pleural thickening, the mediastinal thickening has receded quite a bit. The halos 
around the kidneys are gone. The order looks cleaner than before. And her lung disease is now mostly this advanced emphysema. And she's a non-smoker. So, you know, paraceptal emphysema is a very strange beast. Um, it really doesn't behave like central lobular emphysema. It doesn't have that clear relationship to cigarette smoking. I've seen a number of cases of people who get it after some sort of inflammatory condition has receded. So this is one situation in which you have these inflammatory cells, these histiocytes, um, you know, in the lung and they have left the lung and they've left behind a lot of um, emphysema. So I presume that the macrophages have dissolved the elastic tissue of the lung and created this emphysema. And th in this case, it was adjacent to um, where she had all that soft tissue thickening and lung infiltration from the, the pleural component of her Erdheim Chester. So she has a little bit of pulmonary hypertension and she has severe restriction on pulmonary function testing now. So um, here's, an, here's a case of, I would call this paraceptal emphysema and it's related to this inflammatory condition of Erdheim Chester here. So, you know, we also get emphysema in people with sarcoid. You get this bubbly lung pattern that's not really honeycombing. I can't think, once again, if you've got inflammatory cells, they can eat your elastic tissue in your lungs and leave you with emphysema as the residuum. So the, the question now, there's a PET scan on this person that shows almost no uptake anywhere. So it doesn't seem there's active inflammation uh, in this woman anymore. And it's rather remarkable because she did not have specific therapy. She just had a few courses of prednisone over the years and nothing really that was precisely directed against Erdheim Chester. And uh, they're going to try to retrieve again the early <clears throat> tissue from 2000, the, the 2000s and see if they can identify a mutation. They're looking for this, you know, BRAF and MEC mutation. Typically, I think it's called V600 or something is the common mutation in this. So long-term follow-up for Erdheim Chester with some degree of remission, but consequences here, I think, of chronic inflammation in the lung in terms of paraceptal emphysema. Okay. So the distribution of the cysts is very interesting. Yeah. In the periphery of the lungs and in relation to the pleural surfaces, mostly. I think, so. I, and I think, you know, that's where we had the really intense inflammatory stuff before. If you look at this earlier CT, there was all of this yeah. pleural infiltration here. And that's adjacent to that is where we now have the emphysema in the lungs. So I think macrophages, uh, like to destroy lung tissue. So maybe the, the proliferating um, dendritic cells, the histiocytes, the Erdheim Chester cells somehow sort of upregulate maybe things that degrade lung tissue, right? Yeah. I mean, and I just happen to be concentrated in, the, in those regions particularly. Yep. That's my theory. Okay. So. Uh, you know, this is this is the longest term follow-up uh, I've seen in, in Erdheim Chester since this was our our practically our index case here. Okay, uh, let me see if I have this next case. So here's a <clears throat> a chemotherapy patient um, who came in with a cough, and there is a subtle. This is a, just AP uh, radiograph here. We don't have a lateral view. Uh, you can see that she's had she's had more than one cancer. She currently has MDS uh, that's thought to be secondary to treatment of her previous malignancies, and uh, so she she doesn't have a good immune system. So here's some clips from earlier breast um, tumor resection or biopsy, and then there is this subtle pneumonia lurking behind the heart, and here it is. So people are thinking in this immune compromised situation, first of all, of fungal disease. But here we have this consolidation and kind of an aspiration distribution in the lower lobe. Um, it's got very nice air bronchograms in it. It doesn't really look like fungus. So the reason it doesn't look like fungus is that air bronchograms, in my experience, are fairly rare in fungal pneumonias. I think there's a lot of tissue swelling because of the the inflammation caused by the fungus, and it tends to um, 
shut down air bronchograms. And basically the bronchi are being squeezed. There's not any air in there. So sometimes you'll see a bird's nest, but I've not seen air bronchograms very often in fungal lesions. So I would like you guys to um, to check your own experience and tell me if you if you if you find air bronchograms very often in fungal lesions. So at any rate, it doesn't look like aspergillus in that regard, because aspergillus of uh, nodule of this size wouldn't I wouldn't expect to have air bronchograms, and it doesn't really look like mucor again because it just doesn't look that aggressive. And those are the the fungi we see most often, and there may be some surrounding, maybe even hemorrhage from this, but I don't think she was coughing up blood. There are a few other lesions that might also be fungal, such as this one here in the right base. I think there was one other on the right. So, um, you know, we still have a high suspicion for fungus. Nocardia is a possibility. You know, around here, cryptococcus is a, is a consideration for something like this, and that can be indolent. So this thing progressed slowly, and this they finally identified this, and this is Trichophyton Asahi, which is a it's an organism found in sale in in uh, soil. It is a yeast-like organism, and it is uh, usually not a pathogen internally. It can cause some white patches on skin. It's usually pretty superficial, but in an immune-compromised person like this, it can get into the bloodstream. Often, it gets in from skin, and it can go to lung. And so this is probably inhaled lung involvement with this uh, trichophyton here, which is usually doesn't get inside the body unless the person's immune compromised. So I have one previous case of this organism, uh, trichophyton uh, asahi, and um, it was in a different um, compromised setting. So yet another fungus, um, <clears throat> you know, they're just waiting. Uh, you lower your defenses and these things that are all around us creep in and set up house gaming. They would normally you know, be killed before they could uh, take hold like this case. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Add that to the list. He's on uh, boriconazole. Yeah. In reviewing a lot of aspergillus cases, David, I don't recall seeing air bronchograms with invas angioinvasive aspergillosis. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just, I just tumbled that, I think, you know, in, in looking at this case, uh, I was trying to figure out why this doesn't look right for aspergillus. So would you guys check my hypothesis? Um, you know, maybe that's worthwhile. Yeah. Okay, All those right. are my, my two cases. All right, yeah. who's up next? I can go. Uh, so this is a case, uh, just an interesting kind of clip case. This is a person I'll, for the CT who developed, had some sort of trachea, I can't remember why she developed some tracheal injury. They put a stent in, uh, she subsequently developed, and they use these little, to anchor the stents, they use these little clips, and they she then developed a big tracheoesophageal fistula, which they then put in a bifurcating tracheal stent in, and you'll see that, here, let's start, sorry, here. So you'll see that these clips that were here that were part of the esophageal stent, they just kind of left in and didn't really take those out. I don't know if they thought that they would um, be swallowed and just kind of come out. And you can see that they're here, here, and then the one's fallen into the left main stem bronchus, so it's actually gone through the tracheoesophageal fistula into the uh, left main stem bronchus. And then it pops out into, actually went onto the other side and fell into the lung. And then they were really concerned because they didn't know what to do as this thing was fell, fell in the lung. And I, I don't know what happened to the last radiograph. It's, uh, but anyways, it then it disappeared. And the reason it disappeared is she coughed really hard and felt something hard in her mouth. And she actually coughed up this clip. Um, so this was some sort of retained clip from an esophageal stent that subsequently, so here's her tracheoesophageal fistula. You can see pretty nasty. And here are these little esophageal clips they put in to anchor down the stent that, again, they left in. So, And then it eventually fell into the lung, but she coughed it out. Uh, what case is this? Oh, this is so a nice 
those clips yeah. look like the uh, the the clips that they do for uh, bleeding varices too. They look like um, they go through the working channel of the endoscope, and, and they kind of expand outwards. And you'll you sometimes we'll see them in patients with li chronic liver disease. And I wonder, I guess they can use them for the anchor, like you suggest, like you suggested. Hmm. So okay, hemostatic clips. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, this is what they look like. Yeah, I've seen them used also for, that's what I'm saying, for hemostasis. Yeah. But they, they, they fit through the endoscope. That's why they're, they have that funny shape. Oh, interesting. And this is a patient was sent to us kind of with a diagnosis. And it, I think looking at it, it's something we just don't see out here um, that often in California. I didn't see that often in, in Maryland. I'm sure Jeff sees a lot of this. Uh, it's a young patient. She has this conglomerate mass like soft tissue in the right hilum, squeezing down the PA, right lower low PA pretty well. Uh, the right upper lobe also mildly narrow. The right superior pulmonary vein is gone. The inferior pulmonary vein is actually still patent. Uh, the right lung is small in size. And this is a case, this is also pretty because it nicely shows, I mean, not that you would need dual energy to show this, but I think it just nicely highlights. You can see this without the use of dual energy, but uh, I think it just ni nicely highlights the perfusion differences between the left lung, which is normal, and the right lung. And again, we have a little bit of perfusion to the right base, but other than that, it was pretty much down. Uh, so this is a case of fibrosing mediastinitis. What's interesting about it is that it's the first case I've seen, and I know it can happen. It's just the first one I've seen that doesn't have any uh, apparent calcifications. So uh, this is a woman who came here from Arkansas. Uh, I don't know if she was diagnosed as CTEF or came here because we are a CTEF center thinking that they would do something. Um, but I don't know, Jeff, you, you've seen a lot more of this than I have. How many cases do you, have you seen that are have no calcification whatsoever? Very few. Yeah. I see with like sarcoid or TB, it's been described, but typically with histo, you get the more focal and big mass like calcification. Yeah. Have you looked in the spleen? Are, is there anything in the spleen? Nothing in the spleen. Nothing in the spleen. Is it just more that it's, it's an acute in, inflammatory phase? And no, she, she had, so this is a year. So here's a uh, study from a year ago um, showing that it's completely unchanged and she actually underwent don't ask me why she underwent some sort of biopsy of these presumably venous infarcts uh but they also took out some tissue from the right hilum and they i mean the, the diagnosis was findings highly suggestive of but not diagnostic of fibrosing mediastinitis again it's it's completely unchanged they're going to re-biopsy it just to make sure um given the diagnosis from the outside. Uh, I think the imaging fits for it, except for the calcification. I've seen plenty that are isolated to the hyla, um, but this is the first I've seen without calcification. Again, the lack of change is also suggestive, but we'll see what it, if it turns out to be anything different. Uh, but she's, she's young, nothing in the spleen, uh, unilateral, so probably not sarcoid, uh, you know, no history of TB or anything. So uh, we'll see, but I, I think it's a it's a good look minus the calcification. Now, what would you guys recommend um, for this? Because I told them, you know, rebiopsy is not going to hurt. Uh, would you be confident with that diagnosis of fibrosing mediastinitis with an outside biopsy saying finding suggestive of it, or would you ask for further uh, tissue? No, go with it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd be fine with it. Are yeah, no, I, I, I told them they're, they're going to go in and try to muck around and open up this PA. I don't know how they're going to do it. So they're going to take tissue anyways. I know. I, I know. Okay. I know. So how about, uh, how about stent placement? Was that considered in her? Yes, that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to do a stent placement or even they talked about a bypass. I don't even know what they'd be bypassing. But uh, the I'll, problem I'll, with operating on this, Seth, is that it makes it worse. It, it, uh, it's, it's in a, you know, it, that stimulates even greater. Um, scarring so you really don't want to muck around in it. it it's a disservice to the patient yeah i'll bring that uh up to the surgeon again we we told him that it doesn't usually work but uh 
Uh, we'll see. We'll see if they, if they listen to us. But I no, I, I agree. Um, I don't know if they're. I don't I have no idea what they're planning for. But hopefully, they just leave it alone. Uh, we did the case here uh, about ten years ago, and I think it helped. Yeah, if you can get the vessels before they shut down, that's the best. But it's always from the inside. Uh, you, know, you want to typically avoid going in mediastinum. And there's you saw those bronchial collaterals. There's often lots of bleeding. They're huge. Yeah, yeah. They're just massive. They're just absolutely massive. Um, so, and you can imagine that the bronchioles are actually feeding, you know, a large amount of, you can even see them going into the, vessels probably feeding a fair amount of the pulmonary system here uh sometimes you know sometimes the biopsies in this are mistaken for sarcoma because there could be you know there's so much stimulation of that of that um of the fibrogenic tissue that it can look kind of wild and it can be mis misinterpreted as sarcoma yeah so this is a case where you know, if you're flying through it, fortunately, you know, this guy would get a CT anyways. But I think if you're flying through your standard trauma radiographs guy, you know, everyone comes in trauma, trauma, trauma. Uh, I, I probably would have missed it. Uh, I wouldn't have missed it on CT, but it's a pretty good example of uh, overlapping vertebral bodies, which is always a bad thing. Uh, and this was picked up. And... Here's the CT. So, wow. Oh, that's terrible. So I that mean, there's so little hematoma there too on the radio. I know. I know. Jeez. But there was some. There, there was some swelling. Can, can we look at? Um, I mean, there is a mediastinal hematoma there. Can you um, can you give us a coronal from the CT or something like that? There's no coronal from CT, of course. Uh, let me see. Cross sections. Decide about how we're going to do this without. Yeah, see, there's that stripe outside the aorta, that convexity in the lower mediastinum. Yeah, yeah. but it's not it's a lot. Remark it's that remarkably that subtle uh, to me. Uh, there is, yeah. it is. That's what I was picking up on the plane film rather than the vertebral overlap. Oh, really? Jeez. Uh, someone showed this to me. I'm like, yeah, it's every trauma radiograph. And he's like, look closer. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Double, ex double exposure. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And then the last case, which is, uh, I presume he lost his his um, his leg function from that, right? Why? Yeah, I, he was I paralyzed yeah. from that. He yes. Had to then, right? Oh yeah. No, no. He 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 was uh, someone from Mexico who came here. Oh, did it not come over? Ah, oh, son of a gun. Okay. Um, it's a nice case. I I can show that the 40 flow is really nice on it too. So this is a, a very asymptomatic 70 year old woman who had a cough, uh, of course gets a chest X-ray, the chest X-ray finds something abnormal, gets a CT and then the CT leads to MR. It's a very nice case of a uh, scimitar syndrome. So the right lung is hypoplastic or hypogenetic. I still am unsure what the right term is, if it's hypoplastic or hypogenetic. There's really no right upper low bronch branching. I'll show you the CT. And here's that single vein draining pretty much the entire right lung. There is a little accessory middle lobe uh, vein. It doesn't really, it's a tiny little nugget, but this little thing here. But all the blood flow for the most part is going through the uh, anomalous structure. Now, the reason why I think it's patient is actually not that symptomatic is two reasons. One, the majority of the blood flow is not is going to go to the left lung because the right is small, but also it doesn't show that well here. It shows better on the, the 40 flow. Where this vein comes around and goes into the IBC, it makes a very tight turn, and it's very, very narrow right before it does that turn and dumps in, and it's kind of squished. So I think inherently that would narrow or increase significantly the pulmonary venous pressures in the right lung. So right here it got really, really tight and further uh, reduce the blood flow. And when we did the blood flow, uh, about two thirds to three quarters went into the left lung and about a quarter, a third went into the right lung, which would correspond with the fact of reason why she's seven years old and never knew she had this. And this I have to say is one of those 
for some reason, this and sinus venosis are the two that I've seen most commonly in older patients who are relatively asymptomatic. Um, so again, here you can see this makes this turn and it gets real tight around here. And then I just, you know, I, I tried, there's, there's both hip arterial bronchi. There's no, to me, there's just no right upper lobe. The, the branching pattern is a little strange overall, but I don't really see a typical right upper lobe branching pattern, but it's hard to tell with these. Um, I just haven't seen one in a, in a couple of years. It's just a nice example. Nice. Yeah, very nice. But uh, all right, that's it, Jeff. All right. Um, so, Jeff, yeah. Jeff, can I make a little correction? I was identifying that fungus as, as trichophyton when we uh, described it earlier, and it's actually trichosporon. Sorry, I got the wrong one. Is trichophyton the one that causes like uh, cerebric dermatitis and stuff? Well, a trichosporon can do that. Oh. I, trichophyton is, um, is a skin organism too, and it does have skin manifestations. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. All right, Travis, Howard? Yeah, I can go. All right. All right. You see a VQ scan? Yep. Yeah. So Seth, this one is probably is apparently coming your way based on the VQ scan. And you will see the CT does not match up with the VQ scan. So this is a 46-year-old woman who has worsening shortness of breath over the course of a couple years. And there are too many mismatches, mismatch filling defects to count. So on the VQ scan, it sure looks like it could be chronic thromboembolic disease. And that's what it's billed as. This is an outside CT that I just saw today. And this is, let me go to the original one. She had two CTs and frustratingly, they're both three millimeter slice thickness. This was the thinnest they are. So anyone that's still doing three millimeter slice thickness CTAs out there, please stop. But you can see she has filling defects, but when you actually look at them, they're not in the arteries, they're actually in the veins. And so there's a macroscopic filling defect here in this right superior pulmonary vein. If you don't believe me, you'll see the arteries are next to the airways here. And this is clearly a vein not associated with an artery. Same thing in the lower lobe. You can see here, this is macroscopic occlusion of a pulmonary vein going into the left atrium right here. And she does have pulmonary hypertension, no surprise. Her left heart is normal. And when you look at her lungs, she just has what looks like pulmonary edema. That's what it's called. So I, we don't have a diagnosis yet, but I've never been more confident saying that I think this is going to be a case of pulmonary venoocclusive disease. The question is, have you guys seen macroscopic pulmonary venous occlusion like this? Here's, for example, here's the left lower lobe. You can see it's a good example of it just going into the left atrium right there. And it's not slow yeah. flow or anything? I don't think so. I mean, that would be the only, I, I have seen it a couple times here. Okay. And, but I, mean, this one, this I don't know. Getting, and, yeah. And I'm always making the assumption it is, but we never get delays to confirm that it is versus yeah. it is low flow. So, but it looks, I mean, geez, it's about as good as it can get in terms of imaging, it's, but. Uh, yeah. And some of them are even a little, like this one, it feels like it's expanded a little too. But it's also, you just don't have the other findings you'd see with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. There's no oligemia, it's like hyperemia, if anything, from- No, it's not CTEF, it's definitely- there. No, exactly. So yeah, this one, I just saw this today and talked like to a, a clinician. You'd like I think a 30 or 40 year old woman? 46 year old, yeah. yeah. Right and this was a CT a couple months later and it's still, you know, it's, it's the exact same areas. Like that one looks a little dilated right there. You know, slightly, it's still an arteriogram from a few uh, from a couple months later. But in, in you know, at first when I was looking at this hyaline, you wonder could any of this be fibrosing mediastinitis? But the arteries are really patent. I think it's more just that you have lymphadenopathy, like you like you often can see with with pulmonary venoocclusive disease. Uh, well, Travis, so, it's and I thought we don't think that this could be sarcoid. I mean, there's there's a whole lot of stuff around the hyla and in the mediastinum that, you know, we, we've had those cases of sarcoid pinching off pulmonary veins, but you're, you're saying that there are filling defects in the veins. Like um, that. Yeah. So could that be, but proximally is that, is that vein patent or does that go to an obstructed? 
prox well down so the left atrium that's the other reason i don't think it's necessarily slow flow because see the you can trace the vein distal to that into the left atrium and then when you scroll up you see that that portion of it is just it looks like it's just thrombosed yeah it seems to be peripheral. it makes no sense that you would have flow downstream if it wasn't an upstream you know obstruction if it was slow flow you'd see less flow in the left atrium as well if it were just smoke and those pulmonary like veins are pinched off in the hyla where there's all that extra tissue the, the pulmonary veins no are... they're not no some of them now there is some narrowing I'll, I'll grant you that but it's not you know just confined to those areas there are actually pulmonary veins that are obstructed and some of this tissue is weird because it goes out even along the bronchovascular bundles here it's so there's the possibility that the nodal tissue may just be edematous nodal tissue rather than a cellular process within the nodes, right? Yeah. And the lymphatic okay. right, because that's one dilate as well. Yeah. Look along the fissures, the subpleural interstitium looks nice and thickened because all that fluid has to get out somehow. I think you get with you know, if you think about like when you have a fibrosis myostenitis, you get exuberant septal lines because you all that lymphatic flow can't go anywhere. But at least here, the lymphatics are presumably open. Yeah, that's a great case. The other so nice finding is the left atrium is small, which is often described. Yeah, exactly. And the right, and that's the way I comment. Yeah, the the left heart is normal. The left heart was normal on on echo, but they were going with the VQ scan, and and this is not the first case. Brett and I were talking about this this morning that we've seen other cases of of. PVOD, where the VQ scan mimics uh, CTAF for this reason, I think. But but uh, have you ever seen gross, you know, macroscopic thrombosis like this? In no, and that's what that's what I find so remarkable here. That's what I was wondering if anyone else has seen that. No, there are intravascular yes, lymphomas, guys. Should should we be considering this might be tumor in those veins? It's a reasonable thought, like lymphoma or something. But I, I yeah, we'll see. I mean. It's, we know it's not CTEF, we don't know what it is, but it, it's a pulmonary veno-occlusive disease of some cause because she's got horrible pulmonary hypertension. So yeah, I, I think given the, uh, chronic, yeah. yeah, given the chronicity of it, I would, I would think that the nodal tissue is edema, chronic edema, and the consequences of chronic edema to explain the nodes, yeah. but the, the vascular findings are peculiar for sure. Yeah, well, I, that one went to the top of the list when I saw it this morning. I've got a couple of other interesting ones. Let me show, this one's really quick. This, this is an old, relatively well-known case from here, you know, over a decade ago. And this is a patient who has a type A dissection at the time. And, you know, the story of this one is you can see the left atrium, and then this was reviewed several times with, you know, and nobody... The, it, originally, it was thought that this was the left atrium here, but then, of course, you see this is actually the left atrium, and so this is like a double left atrium sign, if you will, from just what you can see is a big pseudoaneurysm collecting in the mediastinum here and exerting mass effect on the pulmonary arteries. And so we've seen this sometimes postoperatively when you get a dehiscence from a valve, like especially along the mitral aortic intervalvular like fibrosa, where you can get something that collects between the left atrium and the, the vessels. And so this is just a huge one where you can see even a little bit of, of smoke going in there, the white smoke. But I show that one to set up this one. This is probably the most, one of the most interesting TAVR cases I've seen. This was, we were reviewing this. And they're talking about TAVR placement. This is a 69 year old who's had worsening aortic valve function over the course of a year. And wait, that's not the right study, this. So this is his, this is his TAVR CT from this month. And you'll see that there's left atrium, and this looks like left atrial appendage, except it's not. It's not connecting to the left atrium at all. I mean, it even has some of that morphology where you think it's a left atrial appendage if you're not attuned to what you're looking at. And the left coronary cusp also looks a little thickened here. And so I'll show you, this was the gated portion. And just, so I'm not gonna belabor the point, but there is a communication just along the LV outflow tract, inferior to the left coronary sinus right there, or the left coronary cusp. You can see that this is a, another pseudoaneurysm, not as big, but kind of how these can sneak into the, the, this area. But what's really interesting about this is, is how this patient, you know, the timeline, because he also has cancer and has been imaged several times. This was last year, around this time, 
And he was bacteremic and had this intramuscular abscess. I don't remember what it grew. But you can see his left atrium is normal at that time. And there's nothing, you know, there's a little bit of fluid maybe in the transverse sinus, that's fine. But then two months later or three months later, two months later, he gets a CT, PE protocol CT. And uh, I hate how that happens now. I hate that the, the command Y has disappeared as your default window. So then he gets this PE study and you'll see in this, in this area, this wasn't discovered prospectively, but you can see right in that area, there's like a little bit of extra tissue. It's kind of like, just looks boggy and inflamed. Hmm. So it's like, you can see how this is probably, and they were, you know, when I was going through this at our tavern conference, they were talking about how it, the, the cardiologist was saying how his presentation last year was kind of funny. And they thought he had endocarditis at the time, but never saw anything. But that was, you know, that's where this is. And so it looks like he had some sort of endocarditis with a little perivalvular abscess that developed there. And it just left behind that pseudoaneurysm that we see now, because it's right in that same location. So it's kind of like an early, you know, or, or what you can look for you know, with endocarditis or infection just before it caused the pseudoaneurysm to form. And, and it was also, it was also interesting because the, this was not seen on the TEE that they did planning for, for TAVR either. It wasn't seen prospectively, so. So endocarditis involving the cusp with subsequent perforation of the cusp and, Correct. and then what we see now. Yeah, right here. Gosh. So couple Gosh. of interesting cases. I showed so I'll stop there, Howard. Did you the the time? Yep. Not too long ago with the same thing. It was an abscess and it was so big. It was actually bigger than the left atrium. It was wherever the case was from. I can't remember. It was a, sent to us for something, but it uh, was interpreted as the left atrium. Right. And that's, yeah, and that's the point. Like left atrial appendage or that other one, you know, if you're not looking, it can look like a left atrium. So, okay. All right. Howard. Okay. Okay, let me show you this case because this is a, a really nice case to complement one that David showed, I think it was two weeks ago, and it is very, very similar. So as soon as I show this, David will recognize it in particular. So there is the lesion. You can see how intensely it enhances. And as I scroll back and forth, you'll see the very large bronchial arteries feeding it particularly right there, and the imaging features are absolutely typical of a paraganglioma, which is the case that David showed. His was larger, but if I remember, David was pretty much in the same location, I believe. That's this was a lot bigger. Much bigger. I think Mine, it was David, right? Yours, Howard. So, sorry about that, but... Pardon? Mine's bigger than yours. Much bigger. <laughs> yeah. So, that's a beautiful, it's a classic place. Yeah, that's a nice, nice example. Yeah, it's a very nice example. And there are a lot of big vessels feeding that too, right? Looks yeah. Like one that David showed, I think. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I know I had one in that same location way back when, and it was just a disaster. The surgeons just had a disaster when they got in there because it was so vascular. Yeah, look at this uh, part of the report right there. You know, in my experience, we only see these once in a while, but I think the last one I saw, they did preoperative bronchial artery embolization procedures in anticipation of a difficult operation, but not in this instance, but you can see. Yeah, ours, uh, also, ours, ours was also a bloody mess, and the surgeon said that it was one of the most difficult tumors he'd ever resected in 35 years. And um, and that, that person had already had some embolization at an outside hospital before he came to us because he was having hemoptysis. A question for you guys, because I showed one a couple years ago that was more anterior mediastinal or prevascular that was a paraganglioma. And then have you ever seen one in the right paratracheal space? Because we have a big hypervascular lesion similar in the right paratracheal space, which they've had negative biopsies. I think it's probably Castleman's disease because it was just lymphocytes. But have you seen a paraganglioma more rightward than this before? How how far right and how like like true right paratracheal space? I can send you a screenshot. It, I mean, technically, it should be 
the ones these guys are showing actually are actually the, the one the more one of the least common locations in the mediastinum. Usually, they're as you guys know, they're kind of more anterior in the AP window area or right anterior to the aorta. They can yep. because the parasympathetic or sympathetic ganglia does go a little bit to the right anterior of the area. They can be there, but true right paratracheal, I have not seen one. That doesn't mean they. It's just not a location for the ganglia, from my understanding. But I don't know. Yeah. There's a nice AJR paper talking about the location of the gang ganglia and where these things should occur based on that. And I don't think there's one in the right paratracheal region. Yeah, I've not seen one there. I've seen one, as, as Seth says, subaortic here. I've seen one in the right AV groove, I believe, once. And another one on top of the left atrium, sort of down here. But not paratracheal. Oh. Let me show you this one. This one is um, really disturbing as in terms of the timing of it. So a person um, has a transplant and doesn't do very well after transplantation. So here's an image from 6-7. And then I'll show you some images from later on it's hard to know what's going on at this point in time because there are bilateral lung opacities. Both lungs are involved. And here again on the 14th, we have abnormality on both sides. Um, disturbing, but hard to know what's going on. But then on the 25th, there is substantial abnormality really mostly on one side and the abnormality is really what's going on in the left lower lung, which is really very opaque at that time. And let me just show you a contrast enhanced one three days later now, in which you'll see how bad this left lower load looks. So now it's very bad. So we have a lot of hypoattenuation. We've got cavitation. And this whole area looks like a very large necrotizing pneumonia, which it is. So that evolved in a relatively short period of time after the operation. So that's between around the 7th to the 28th after heart transplantation. And now I'll just show you the uh, things just got really terrible and the patient died. So this turns how we lost very pardon we lost the sound for a minute there sorry a very extensive mucor infection that was very extensive and fatal and i certainly have not seen this kind of mucor occur so quickly after a lung after a heart transplantation which is just remarkable on that ct image that showed uh, the apparent cavitation was there actually um lacy lung tissue in the in that um lucency can we look at it with the you know at this time it just so that's well, the bird know, like that next to the cavitation so that's the bird's nest that's uh mm -hmm. that's that a, a bit of a bird's nest yeah right there must be a hummingbird nest it's Small. terrible yeah um because certainly around it there's tremendous liquefaction the process of lung, kind of as this describes. And there's some pathology slides, but not surprisingly. This is surprising, isn't it, to get such a quick, severe mucor, fatal mucor, just that soon after heart transplantation? Yeah. And moving. That, that yeah. Was it's very disturbing. Don't know why it happened. You wonder if the patient was already immune compromised before the transplant regimen. Maybe the person had been on steroids for some sort of cardiomyopathy or something. I don't know. Sorry, what, what happened there? All right, Jeff. Okay. Um, 
Uh, real quickly, I wanted to share a case with the group um, that was shared with me um, and see what you guys think. I don't have a definitive diagnosis, but I have my thoughts. Um, so this is on the, let's make this bigger. So this is a 26 year old um, with cough, no fever, no TB from Peru. And what I can show here is she's got two findings. And I gotta figure out where the scroll is. There we go. Um, you can see she's got this, this kind of mass in the left apex. And if I change the window on it, you'll see that it's, um, it's essentially necrotic. And then it's got this uh, sort of peripheral calcification. And then the other finding is in the uh, liver. There's a cystic thing with some calcification. So Seth, you may have an idea what this, pro I think what this is. I grab this, it doesn't let me scroll. Um, there's a faster way. Um, but just hit S and you can scroll, I think. Oh, is it? Okay, thank you. That's right, I think so. Yeah, there we go. But see, it's got the cystic thing on the liver. I could pull up the soft tissue ones. But uh, yeah, I don't know what you guys think. 26 year old female, Peru, don't have any other history, has a cough, but here's what it looks like. You can see it definitely looks like it has some calcium on it. It's essentially cystic or necrotic with some enhancing lung around it. Uh, you know, and some reactive nodes in that general vicinity. And it's this, not intravascular. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're thinking what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's much of a, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good look. Don't you guys think for a, a kinococcus? It looks like a, a kinococcus. Yeah. 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 And I did, I did some digging. It, it actually is endemic down there, especially up oh, in the mountains where they have sheep. And um, oh, yeah. it's a very specific uh, subtype of of a kind of caucus there. Was oh, it different? Well, it's the same species. It's just a different genotype one. But it's like a G3 of the kind of caucus granulosis or whatever. So is this hematogenous spread or is it through the pleura? Because there was a little bit of pleural thickening or effusion posteriorly up higher on the left. Yeah, and even I there, maybe yeah, so a little. Contralateral to the liver side. So I would guess it's hematogenous. And I don't know how long it's been there. It's already started to calcify. It hasn't sloughed, but. I think it's a really good look. I mean, this is what they, I yeah. said, Seth, you shared one years ago down on the right lower lobe that had this sort of it, it consolidated lung around it, but has this very discreet rim. Yep. Yeah. And then a little, a little calcium. Okay, good. Well, that's what I told them as well. I thought it was a kind of cockle cyst. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Yep. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, Bye. Thanks for that.